or nuclear breath. I'm sorry, I always say that it's not true, but uh, I I think that 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 would bring a more um badass uh, approach to it too, without without really departing too much from the original design, and it would still look fairly well. Uh, especially in CG, you could do the muscles really well without having to worry about someone collapsing with all the weight. <laughs> um, well, what's ironic is that in that film, Roland Emmerich, he showed the he showed destruction of the city, and what he did in doing Godzilla is show the monster destroy the city. So no, he didn't. There, there's a little thing of uh, you gotta ask him what's wrong. What, what, what did you do wrong? Yeah. What happened? Like, uh, if you're a Godzilla fan, even if you're not a Godzilla fan, you know that Godzilla destroys cities. So. That's Why that's his trademark not trait. Knock down a single building in the ninety eight film. I mean, he runs through one, but it doesn't even fall down. Yeah. The MetLife and building. The, the city is not even in flames, and in the fifty four Godzilla, you clearly see the city in flames, like oh. it's uh, it's engulfed in a war zone. And in the in Tokyo the looked like hell in that movie. It's I mean, I love that one shot where um, I don't know if you remember this specific shot. But um, there's like fire coming up behind the buildings, and you see Godzilla's outline like walking behind the fire, and it really like looked oh, like yeah, hell. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's like um, one of my favorite yeah. shots in that whole movie. Yeah, I think all I think all shots in that film are beautifully done. You know, I think Shiro Honda, you know, he captured the essence of war that he experienced in World War II and brought it onto Godzilla, and I think that's why he did a terrific job, and I think it's why it's considered a masterpiece. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. Something that the 1998 film failed to do completely, but I think it's something that Garrett Edwards can do. Yeah. Because of, uh, I, I know you see monsters because I think you're a review. Which I don't uh, agree I with you're... anymore. Yeah, in, in, that, in that film, uh, Monsters, Garrett Edwards, what he did was kind of show, like, uh, what happens after a monster attack. Like, this is what happens after Cloverfield ends. And you kind of get that sense that, uh, Monsters are everywhere. One washes off on the on the beach every few months or so. Yeah. You know, life's gone back to normal, but you know it's still changed because you know now we know that the world exists with monsters. And um, the film was shot in Mexico, and you kind of get that sense that the film is a uh, it's still it's still in a war zone because of the monsters. And, yeah. Um, if Jack Edwards can bring that feel after a monster attack, imagine the the type of vibe and atmosphere he can bring during in a, mo a monster attack, in this case Godzilla, which would be would bring devastating results to either San Diego, um, New York, whichever American city. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, um, I, I completely disagree with my review of that, because um, one thing I said was that uh, you don't see the monsters enough, and I think that's part of the beauty oh, yeah. of it now. And, uh, I mean, I still kind of wish you saw them a little more, but... Um, with what he could do with his budget, um, I thought that he made a fantastic movie with atmosphere and not a lot of uh, showmanship special effects. One of my favorite shots in that movie is, um, remember the scene where they're on the boat and uh, they start going by all this destruction where the monsters have been going through? And you see that, like, I think it was a jet that was down in the river and it had, like, moss growing around it. Yeah. And you could tell that that's been there for a while. It shows that even Garrett Edwards, with a limited budget he has, he can still bring some sort of a eerie, suspenseful, scary-like uh, atmosphere to even a particular scene like that. Yeah. Because you, you, don't, you don't see the monster again. You, you just hear him, and you, even in your mind, you can help. So, where's the monster? Where's the monster? Is it behind them? And then you see it up ahead of them, and it just brings down this this old ancient jet down. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my favorite scene in Monsters is at the end where... The two, uh, the, the two squid monsters come together and just start glowing pink. Yeah. And um, I don't know that, that shot. Yeah, I, I like the choice of the CGI because of um, it, 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 it looks so realistic. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead to calling it Avatar like CGI, but it kind of reminded me of that because of uh, of all the texture and the um, and just everything about that. Derek Edwards did a terrific job on that. And um, if, if he could do a great CGI like that with the monsters in that film, I, I can just imagine the CGI he'd be, he probably might do with Godzilla, if Legendary allows him to do the CGI as well. Yeah. 
Um, one uh, interview I saw with him, um, I think this this was about Godzilla, and he kind of brought up monsters. Was um, he said he wanted to make the film with a big budget, like he was making monsters, and that shot um, uh, kind of brought that uh, brought that quote up in my mind because um, because it. If you use the atmosphere really well, it makes it only more impressive when we see Godzilla for the first time. Um, like, if you just see, like, buildings crumbled and fire and cars um, destroyed and just the gray shells, and then it just builds up all this atmosphere, and then you see him in, in his all-glory, it's just a very rewarding moment. And I think that that's why he was perfect for the director's chair in this. Yeah, definitely. And um, I don't mean to be racist here. But, uh, yeah, Derek Edwards is, uh, is British, and I don't know if it's a myth or not, but I heard that the, that the, um, the English, they, they put stories and characters before action and CGI, which is particularly true. Absolutely, you, yeah. You, you, you look at the case of Christopher Nolan, who's a, who's a natural-born Brit himself, mm -hmm. and look what he did with the, the Batman series and Inception. It's all story and characters first. And he grips you with that. He doesn't grip you with action or CGI. He grips you with the characters. He makes you feel for them and care about them. Yeah. And he, he really plays with your mind. It's like an intimidating game with your brain. Which is and, why he was uh, perfect for Batman. Using fear uh, as an intimidator. Well, I was saying, like, you, mean, you said, like, uh, the, he uses your mind to intimidate you. And I was saying that's why, yeah, that's so why he was perfect for he Batman. It's kind of like a guessing game. Like you, you don't know what's going to happen next, next but you're, you're you're just guessing. You, you keep wondering what happens, what's going to happen next. Yeah. And he does that very well with the Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. and, um, what, what he did with the Joker is he he really brought that character to life from the comic books. Yeah. In the comic books, he's always unpredictable, and you can't tell if he's psychotic, crazy, or if he's just you know playing around. Hence the name the name the Joker. Yeah. And Christopher Nolan just, you know, he, he sticks with the essence of that. In The Dark Knight, he just, you know, he, he really brought out what true story and characters can bring without the need of too much action. And uh, I think Garrett Edwards brought that out, too, in Monsters. I, I, I believe that um, he, he set out to do a film where about these two characters in a monster situation and just tell a story with characters that are believable. I don't think he was setting out to do just a, a plain old monster movie, cut and dry, monster smashes stuff. I think he just wanted to tell a story with two characters with a limited budget, just like uh, Neil Blomkin with uh, District 9. I love that movie. Yeah, definitely. That, that, that's the future of Hollywood right there. Like, you're right, filmmakers like uh, Neil Blomkin, Derek Edwards, who can make a great film out of the limited resources they have, they can, they can make more with uh, bigger budget films. And, yeah. You know, not take advantage of it too much by you know showing too much action like Michael yeah. Bay does. Oh, this. yeah. That's his problem. Uh, Michael Bay, I'm talking, but he um, he he just shows it, and then once you see it, you're not that impressed, or at least not you know I'm not, because there's no build up to it. You just see it, it's there, and then I'm unimpressed. <laughs> I see him as the American version of Roland Emmerich, who's German. Yeah. And you, you look at filmmakers like Roland Emmerich, uh, Michael Bay, Stephen Sommers, who directed Van Helsing and G.I. Joe. Those directors are capable of turning, you know, classical franchises and just turning them into action flicks. Mm -hmm. um, if you see Van Helsing, obviously that, that film is a... It is a homage to the Universal Monsters, like Dracula, the Griffin, and Frankenstein, and he turned it into an action picture. Yeah, and Michael I... Bay, what he did was um, he brought Transformers, this um, this toy line that was meant for kids under the ages of twelve and under, and turned it into a, a teenage boy dream with you know Megan Fox and these toyless humor jokes. Yeah. Um, it just goes to show that I think uh, Legendary Pictures did a wise choice with a non-American director because uh, again not to be racist I'm American too but uh, yeah. m most American directors focus on you know those elements that you know make uh, summer blockbuster movies great like Transformers but you know they yeah. don't really make you feel like uh, uh, they, they don't make you feel like uh, was it worth the money or was the, the story 
really uh, worth my time. Yeah. They're, they're all what they are, mindless. And um, like that's what Roland Emmerich did with Godzilla. Like, it was mindless. And it was eh. Where's the mind? Where's the heart? Where's yeah, the exactly. Heart? Um, I think that American filmmakers, what they tend to do is they take the visual part of movie making, the mo- you know, the picture part of motion picture, and then they exploit that, and that's all they have is just a visual medium with no real heart to it, and no like um good dialogue, good writing. It's always do we have impressive action, good CGI, and attractive people in our movie, and then the rest of it should just be um should all come last, and um as long as we have those things, we'll make money. That's that seems to be the mentality yeah. now, which is horrible. Yeah. And, That's why I think um, the action genre of today is kind of being taken advantage of. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's not about the old school macho badass guys with the uh, bigger guns, bigger muscles, bigger explosions like Rambo, the Terminator, Die Hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those classic films. It's, it's all about you know these robots fighting each other for no reason. In the middle of New York, or Los Angeles, or wherever. LA, or DC, or Chicago, wherever, yeah, yeah, wherever there's big buildings yeah. and hot girls, basically. Yeah, it, it is all mindless. Like even in the um those '80s action films, the action has meaning. The action has real meaning. There's an actual it plot. The concept of yeah, good guy versus bad guy. Yeah. And in the case of uh, films like Transformers, it's all about fighting for the sake of fighting, and. Like, really, really, you're going to spend a million dollars on that concert? Uh, you, you can watch that for free on the internet. It's called wrestling. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing, and you don't need to worry about a plot. Yeah. Now, you brought up Die Hard, yeah. and I think that's a great example. Because that movie really, really tries to both make the protagonist likable and the bad guy really unlikable, but at the same time fun to watch. And... They really su- succeed in doing that in that movie because they give du- uh, they have really good dialogue and banter between each other, which really set them apart as characters and make them really um really good rivals for each other. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, Rambo Four. It's the latest Rambo that came out in two thousand eight. Um, uh, I've seen parts of it and I didn't really like it. Uh huh. Uh, but um, and, and that film. Um, you, you had the old character Rambo and the villains who were just completely evil. Yeah. You, 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 see, you see them burning these villages, killing millions of people, even children, actually even killing children. Yeah. And at the end of the film, you, you see what you you see Rambo giving giving it to them. So get, like the old saying, getting what's coming to you, and it works. Absolutely. That whole, that whole cheering thing, cheering for the hero. And that's what's kind of lacking in most action films nowadays. Yeah. Especially in Michael Bay films. Like, uh, when I watch Transformers, I kind of don't feel like I'm cheering for the for the uh, Autobots. Or the like, humans. Sometimes I'm even cheering for the Decepticons. And uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't seem too motivational. It's just like, you know, boom, boom, boom. Explosions left and right. Megan Fox's ass on the <laughs> right. And then Shia LaBeouf just yelling, Optimus! Optimus! <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> It's like, that's my huge problem with Michael Bay, and Roland Emmerich might even, is actually superior with, to him with this, very lightly, mind you. Um, yeah. He, what he does, what Roland Emmerich, what, not, uh, Michael Bay, sorry, I always get them mixed up. Uh, what Michael Bay tends to do is he picks villains, quote-unquote, but, um, and just that he can completely um, demoralize and unhumanize, and... Um, then he doesn't need to give them any motivations because he thinks the audience will not be thinking enough to ask why are they doing this and why does the hero have to stop them. And, and, you know, that's my big problem with him. And Roland Emmerich, not to really give him too much credit, but just to give him a little credit, he did it a little better with um, Independence Day, I thought, um, even though they had no reason why the aliens showed up. But... The thing was, you saw the aliens attacking ordinary innocents first, and then they had them attack the military. And yeah. you felt like the military really had a good reason for fighting them, and the action had purpose to it. Now, the human—I mean, the human characters weren't like three-dimensional sympathetic people, but the aliens made them likable because the aliens just came in and annihilated for no good reason. 
Um, and even in Godzilla 98, which was done worse, but, I mean, you got this, I mean, Godzilla wasn't even like, or Zilla, I'm gonna say, um, the, the problem was that he didn't do that much to really cause, um, enough destruction. Yeah, you felt like the military was overreacting in some cases. Um, but even then, it, they had the, the parts with the, the, with the baby Zillas, and, uh, I, I felt like... As a, matter, as a matter of fact, now that you, sorry, now that you bring that up, in, in the 1998 Godzilla film, the Zilla didn't seem that threatening at all. No, not it at all. Like he just appeared there for no, no reason. And yeah, you're right, it seemed like the military just overreacted. They're like, okay, it's, it's a giant monster, let's kill it. You know, <laughs> why do we need to kill it? What, what did the monster do? Did, did it kill people? All it did was... I didn't see any. I didn't even see any ambulances in Manhattan during that movie when uh, after Zilla attacked for the first time. All I saw was a bunch of angry New Yorkers who seemed to think the same thing the audience was. Why the hell are they evacuating the city? There's one building with a hole through it, and then there's one building with a couple windows taken out of it. That's it. Yeah. Um, just to jump back to Legendary Pictures for a second, um, with the design, um. I really want them to make it look like Godzilla is a real threat and not just um, a silly, you know, kind of creature that a lot of people take Godzilla as. You know, just a, to quote Deviant Sun 13, uh, a guy in a rubber suit kicking, uh, uh, uh oh, sorry, uh, cardboard. Yeah, just kick, yeah, just kicking um cardboard aliens. Um, and I think that that we should really see him as a true threat that either can't be destroyed or is difficult to destroy, because um. More like yeah. Gone. Huh? Gone? Yeah. Um more like uh thank God was like your worst nightmare. Absolutely. Um and uh I, I think that um bringing the nuclear aspect into it might actually kind of uh help with that. Because you know, no one likes nuclear weapons and if you make Godzilla a little bit sympathetic with the fact that he was a mistake it might go a little bit away to not only making him sympathetic, but also making him even more terrifying because there's barely, there's never really been any force created by our military to stop a nuclear weapon. Save pseudoscience, of course. Um, so how present do you want the nuclear aspect of it to be in the, the Legendary Pictures version? Anything 